One thing that sets the Nero Electric apart from other electric vehicles is that this thing is front wheel drive standard versus the traditional rear wheel drive you're gonna find in a number of other electrics for their entry level trims. But the downside though, is that the Nero is not available all wheel drive. So if you do want all wheel drive, you'd have to bump yourself up to the EV6. I have done a compare video looking at the Nero versus the EV6. So if you wanna see that one, you'll find it down in the description of the video. It's just that like, if you live in snowy climates, having the option to be front wheel drive rather than rear wheel is just infinitely better. All wheel drive is a step above, but I'd rather be front wheel than rear wheel drive in the winter time, hands down. But one thing I like about Kia vehicles across the board is that you have a series of selectable drive modes. So there's normal, sport, and then eco mode. And then there's also a snowy drive mode on top of that. And you can adjust them all through your cluster screen, which I'll touch on once we get inside. There are a few different style lamps you're gonna find inside of the Nero EV, with LED headlamps being standard in the Wave, so the highest trim level of the vehicle. And there are a lot of other great features you're gonna find in that higher trim. One of them is gonna be a forward sensing system, which is not available in the wind trim levels whatsoever. So no packages that you can add on to get that. But the overall styling in the front end here, it's just, it's so Kia. Like, especially if you look at something like the Seltos, which the front end here does definitely remind me of. This cityscape green is pretty neat though. And all of the different highlights, like the black bezels, lower part of the bumper, and then all of the different metallic highlights, pops, it looks nice. The front end has a little texture there, and then there's also the charge door right in the very middle. The Nero does support level one, level two, and level three DC supercharging. It does come with a 20 foot cable right from the factory when you purchase, but the downside is that it's strictly a level one charge cable. So I think you're maxing out at like 57 hours for level one charging, which I mean, if you're only driving like 10, 20, 30 kilometers a day, you could definitely get away with level one. But if you're putting on like 100, 150 kilometers a day, you're absolutely gonna wanna look at a level two instead. Because looking at level two, depending on your voltage, you're anywhere between six and nine hours roughly to go from zero to 100. So definitely recommend that route if this thing is a daily driver and you're putting on substantial kilometers or mileage on your vehicle. In the front end, if you look just between the I and the A and Kia, there is a little release. And this thing is on hydraulics. But underneath the hood of electrics, like, there's not really much. I like the way that Kia's designed it, so it's almost like a traditional internal combustion engine instead. You can easily top up your basic fluids there. There is a tiny little frunk. Nothing crazy, but if you need a tiny little bit of storage space for the front end, it is available there. Inside of the Nero, you're gonna find a 64.8 kilowatt hour battery, and that translates to 201 horsepower and 188 pound-feet of torque, which is pretty respectable. The EV6 is definitely gonna kick that up a notch, but you're also looking at paying a premium price in comparison. Looking at the overall range inside of the Nero EV when you're fully charged up, you're 407 kilometers or 253 miles, which is pretty respectable. You will lose a tiny little bit of your total range in the winter time, but there are different ways that you can set your vehicle up in order to optimize for winter performance as well, like preconditioning your cabin, things like that. There's not much that you have to do inside of electrics for maintenance. You obviously wanna make sure you top up your fluids, brake servicing and things like that. There are still regularly scheduled maintenance intervals you have to follow. Definitely recommend you do because you wanna make sure that you maintain your manufacturer's warranty, which inside of the Kia world is pretty good. Take a peek at the size of the Nero, which the size is gonna remain unchanged regardless of if you're in the electric, the plug-in or the traditional hybrid. There would be the option for crossbars, so if you needed a roof rack carrier, that is available as an option. The side view mirrors do have turn signals there, along with the blind spot monitoring system. So if somebody's into the blind spot on either side of the vehicle, it's going to highlight there to let you know. The doors, there is intelligent access, so you can push there in order to lock the door, or push in order to unlock. Beautiful. Uh, along the side door there, it's very basic. Just your basic handle, all of your side view mirror controls, your window control. It's this nice glossy highlight though. Just matches nicely what's what's going on inside the vehicle. But a little bit of door storage. There's also a speaker there too. We'll touch on speakers in a second. Just inside that glossy highlight follows through part of the dash as well. You can increase or decrease the brightness of the cluster screen. Open or close the lift gate and then toggle traction control on or off. In order to get underneath the hood, giving yourself a pull there, 
basic fuse panel. So if you're wiring a dash cam, things like that, manual telescoping steering wheel, and then you've got your leatherette seat. The seats inside of this thing might be manual or power, depending on the trim level of the vehicle that you're in. So you can go forwards, backwards, up and down with it. There's two-way lumbar support. There's two-way lumbar support, and then there's also the option of adjusting your backrest there as well. Straightforward. The interior of the Nero is nice, it's simple, and there's a boatload of space in this thing too. Like the seat as far down and as far back as it's gonna go, the seat is ridiculous. It goes far, so far back. But if you're like probably 6'6", six, six, you'll probably comfortably be able to sit inside of this vehicle. It's good, I love it. Power seats are great. I do like that there is the option for heated and ventilated first row seats. The heated, ventilate, the heated seat's pretty much available across the board, but the ventilated first row strictly gonna be for that higher trim of the vehicle. And that's the same way with some other technology, like there was an available head-up display on top of that, which this one unfortunately doesn't have. But when I'm in a Nero with a head-up display, I'll drop a link down in the description walking through how to be able to use it. It's the same across every other Kia vehicle. So I actually have done one on the EV6 that had a head-up display. So if you wanna walk through and how that works, I will drop it in the description. But seat comforts there, the headrest, just a two-way adjustable. So it's just up and down. There's no forward, backward for it whatsoever. Still, it's pretty nice. Nice. Next up, taking a peek at the steering wheel as well as the cluster screen inside of the Kia Nero. So this is the EV version of the vehicle, and it's gonna look very similar when you're in some of the other vehicles. So the plug-in as well as the traditional hybrid as well. But walking you through everything you need to know. Steering wheel, most likely gonna have a heated option, and you can turn it on just down the center stack. The steering wheel is gonna be a manual telescoping. So just by your left knee, you can drop down in order to go in and out, up and down to find that perfect position. And then just click it to lock it back into place. But stick on the left-hand side. It's going to be for your lights, so you can adjust, figure out what's going on. I honestly just always recommend keeping it in the auto mode. And then you could flash out high beams and then permanently lock your high beams on by pushing away. So it's essentially in an auto mode right now. What that means is that when you're in the auto mode, if the vehicle senses there's somebody oncoming, it's going to dim your high beams automatically and then turn them right back on again. So you can either flash if you want to, warn people, or put it into the auto mode if you want. Stick on the right side is gonna be for your front wipers. Then there's the tip of that stick in order to get your rear wipers going instead. Very straightforward. Series of different buttons available, but one thing to point out, paddle shifters. So you're gonna be able to go into one pedal or I drive by going to the left. So you can see there you're an I pedal. So what that means, it's one pedal driving. So you'd only have to worry about the accelerator. Take your foot off the accelerator and you go and you slow down very rapidly. You can still use the brake, but with that eye pedal, you really don't have to because of how quickly you slow down. And then you can go into different regen modes by going up and down this way instead. Series of buttons along the side there, and these ones are going to be for the smart cruise control system. So in order to use the smart cruise system, once you drive, you turn it on, increase or decrease one kilometer or one mile per hour at a time. There's a distance indicator, so how close or far are you away from the vehicle that's in front of you. And then there's also the lane follow assist. So one of the big benefits of that system is it keeps you perfectly balanced in your lane as you go. Not fully self-driving because your hand technically has to be on the steering wheel, but it's very, very close at the same time. These buttons let you go through the little cluster screen, which I'll touch on in a second. Along this side, there are two different mode buttons there that let you do a few things. So the top mode gives you the flexibility of going through your different sources. So Bluetooth audio, sounds of nature, USB music, etc. I always just recommend whatever sources you typically have, just go through all of them. Secondary button there gives you the flexibility of going through a few other things. So do you want it to be a map button, reroute, cancel route, EV mode, and things like that. So you can select what you want these buttons to do. From there, you've got a few other options. So if you go into, let's go media for a second, boom, radio, and let's go FM. Perfect. So we go up and down this way in order to go between different presets. You can do a press and hold there in order to seek. This is going to be your volume rocker. So you can go up and down this way. You can push in the middle in order to be able to mute out. You can answer or hang up on a phone call. And then there's also a voice command prompt. So that's gonna let you do things like change songs, radio stations, navigate using your voice, 
but there are so many things. You can open the lift gate, you can close the lift gate, you can adjust the climate settings and things like that. So I definitely recommend getting used to the voice command prompts because there are so many cool things that you can do inside the vehicle. Next one is gonna be your drive mode. So there are a few different modes that are available. So clicking through, you've got sport mode, there's normal, eco mode as well. And then you can also do a press and hold of that button in order to get into your snow mode. So each mode does do something different. It plays you through traction control, stability control, and a few other things. So sport mode essentially unlocks the truest performance inside the vehicle. Definitely recommend sport mode though, if you like to have a little bit of fun. It is a really, really nice feeling there. And the other things we're gonna go through are these buttons in order to go through different pages on the vehicle itself. But before I do, right along the very top, lets you know that you're ready to go, how much mileage you currently have left. So 375 kilometers on this current charge. The auto hold setting, with that one turned on, that one's gonna keep you, uh, that one essentially, if you take your foot off the brake, if you come to a stop, it's gonna hold the vehicle in place. Electronic parking brake, current outside temperature, what your current kilowatt hour usage is. So that would be the equivalent of like your miles per gallon or liters per hundred. So it's what, uh, what kind of economy are you currently getting? The drive mode that you're currently in, and then your current kilometers, so your total kilometers. You've got charge power there as well, so not gonna get anything until you start driving, but when you have regen braking, it's gonna drop, versus when you're accelerating, it essentially works like a traditional tachometer to a degree. You've got what's currently going on with road speed, the gear that you're currently in, so you're in reverse, neutral, whatever the case may be. One cool thing, like when you're in reverse, if you've got the reverse or forward sensing system, it's gonna show up there letting you know. And then if there's an obstacle behind you on the left or right side, it's gonna let you know of a potential obstacle or collision there as well. Really, really neat. Then as you see there, auto parking brake engaged too. And you've got a series of other ones along the top. So you've got this car icon and that's essentially going to be so your settings. So you press and hold okay for settings. That's gonna launch up inside of the cluster, uh, inside of the media screen there. And that gives you a ton of different options. So there are vehicle settings, driver convenience, safety settings, attention warnings, parking safety, and so many other things. The cluster you can adjust out. So the illumination, if you wanna make it brighter, or darker, whatever the case may be. Cluster theme selection, so if you wanted to. So we're currently in the sport mode there. So you can either link it to your drive mode or you can permanently lock it out to one of the other modes instead. You can reset your average consumption, figure out what's going on with info that's there. Do you want it to play welcome sound as well when you get into the vehicle? If you had the head-up display, that would also show up there as an available option, but there are a ton of different things you can do inside of this. But back to the screen itself and moving down, actually let's move across to different pages, and then you've got a few other things. So your driving info, after recharge, accumulated info, if you're idling, and then your current speed. So drive info is when you've turned the vehicle off and then you've turned it back on again, that's that accumulated info. This one is since you've recharged, how far have you traveled? You can press and hold okay in order to reset. And then this is your total accumulated info. So it would essentially be like a trip one counter. So you've got a few different options that are available there and then press and hold okay to reset across the board. Moving down, you can also see your digital speed and you can tweak out the speed through that little cluster, or through the uh, little infotainment screen there instead. Moving across, you can see that this thing just has a regular compass there. But if you go through, let's go map and let's find I guess it helps if I actually type in the T. Go a nice and Canadian of me, Tim Hortons. And I'm gonna go uh, just to one of these options. Set as destination, and we're going to set as destination. No. Watch this. Oh, uh, start guidance. Please proceed to the highlighted route. So you've got, so it's not mapping cluster, unfortunately, but you can see how far to your destination and then what route you have to take. If you had the HUD, this would also show up inside of it too, which is kind of cool, along with your speed and a few other useful things. So I like that you've got that available as an option showing right through the cluster screen. And then when you cancel out, it just goes back to just the traditional compass there instead. And then there's just basic information, which is just gonna be for your tire pressure. So this thing is technically the same as the rest of the Nero lineup, with the exception of this little EV button that gives you a few other options. So most notably is that you'd have the flexibility of going through and adjusting out what's going on with your departure comfort settings. So I'm gonna talk you through the basics of what you need to know and skip some things that you don't necessarily need to know quite as much. 
First one is that you've got the option to change between different user profiles. So if you've got multiple people driving the vehicle, you can change between different users, so driver one, driver two, whatever the case may be, and then change out language. This is gonna be the basic home screen. Swiping across, you can press there to go home, press here in order to turn the display off, bring it back to life, you can edit the home icon. So if you don't like the overall layout, all you're gonna do, just push and hold, and then you can kind of drag around however you'd like to on both screens. And then if you don't like what you've done, you can just reset it back to the factory default screen instead. You've got your current time and date, and then your connection status. So I've got a, a phone that's currently on the wireless charge pad. So you can see along the very top, there's a little wireless charge symbol there. Hopping into the EV mode, you can push to the side in order to get full screen, but you've got your current battery percentage, you've got what's currently going on to a close charger, your total current range if you turn the climate off versus if you keep it on. So it's not a crazy difference between the two of them, which is nice. Then there's also some departure settings there. So departure one versus two. One of the big benefits there is that if you tend to leave the same time every day, so Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, etc., what's going to happen is you could hop back and you can schedule charging in climate as well. So with this next departure turned on, it's gonna give you the flexibility of essentially preconditioning the cabin at that time. And then from there, you figure out if you wanna have your scheduled tar charging coming on at a certain time too. So let's say if you wanted to get cheap electricity rates and you know that's between eight o'clock PM and let's say seven o'clock AM, you can prioritize off-peak charging. You can only charge during off-peak hours as well. Then you just hit okay. And what's going to happen is it's only going to charge during those hours. Then you can also schedule climate to come on as well. So if you, let's say we're in the middle of summer, I guess it works the opposite way with winter as well. But when you essentially you turn this thing on, you've set your departure at that time, it's going to have the cabin preconditioned for you. So you can schedule charging, you can schedule when the vehicle is going to condition the cabin too. So the big benefit there is that rather than wasting electricity, it's going to, when you're plugged in, it's going to just run off of the electricity in the wall instead. So it does save you your overall range. So it is kind of cool you've got that option for either departure and then charging and then climate control settings too. Press this little icon there. So gear icon to get to a few other options. So DC charging, when you're plugged into a DC supercharger, you technically should go 80% max. AC charging, you can go 100% there. Charging current, minimum, max, reduced, etc. Condition mode, so what that's going to do, ideally for winter time driving. So if you're gonna be driving your vehicle year round, definitely recommend keeping the conditioning mode on in the winter time. Utility mode means that you can use the vehicle as a big battery. So if you're glamping, you can turn on this mode and it's essentially going to let you use the vehicle as a big battery instead. Smart regenerative systems. So when you use the paddle shifters along the side, do you wanna have so strong, medium, or just a gentle deceleration instead? And then do you wanna have the charge cable locked always while well, strictly while you're charging or do you just not want the door to lock at all? You can also have voice command prompt too. Not a big one there. That's gonna be the basics of the EV mode. Next up is using factory navigation. So factory nav is straightforward. You can kind of do a pinch that way if you want to, but the second you start going one finger, it's like, oh, you wanna to go to this end destination. So you can push this in order to center back on yourself if you want to. You can do this little split screen, but I do prefer the full screen view instead. Go to basic menu to see what's nearby info, total range, save, you can turn the display off button press to bring it back, and then you can search for addresses. So you can search by point of interest icons, addresses, or coordinates. So it's latitude first, longitude second. And then you could just start typing in. Let's go to Tim Hortons. Got to find one a bit further away. And then you've got the option for best or distance. So shortest distance, etc. So we just select one of these. Set as destination. No. And then you can see there different options that are available. So different routes that you're gonna take. Obviously, I wanna take the shorter route there. Then you can add a waypoint. So let's say if you know you wanna to go to Tim Hortons, but you also wanna maybe go to, and I don't know, let's see, point of interest icons, what's around? Let's go and laugh at people at gas stations for having to fill up. Gonna select one and then hit okay. Then see day, you can add in another waypoint if you want to, or just calculate. And same idea, it's giving us the multiple routes that we can take in order to get to our end destination. Same thing, definitely want to go to the shorter one. Start. There we go. You can see your total route time there, what time you're going to get there. You can close, you can cancel. 
and that's cancel the root out. So it's that simple to be able to do it. You can adjust your navigation volume. So whether that's the voice or the sound effects, navigation priority. So if you've got your radio going and there's a turn coming up, it's going to lower your volume for you. I said plus or minus that way. That's the basics. And then the other one here. So you've got search for addresses, previous destinations. So we could see the two different destinations we looked at there. You can delete them if you want. So just delete. And it's removed all of your previous destinations. You can save places as well, add in a home, work address, and things like that. One of the big benefits of adding these addresses in, if you push the voice command prompt on the steering wheel, you could say navigate home, navigate to work, etc. So your call if you set that one up or not. And then there's some advanced settings along the top and nothing crazy here. So basic guidance information. Do you want to avoid things on the route? So avoid ferries, toll roads, carpool lanes, etc. Alerts, yes or no. Map, do you want to change out the mode of the map? So if you're in like 2D, 3D, etc. Auto scale, do you want to change out different features? Like there's really nothing crazy you need to know about the map there. You can adjust the font size. So if you need to be able to see things a little bit easier, you can go font size. You can change up the color. So if you prefer a darker map instead, actually that darker map looks pretty cool. Watch this. Let's go to the map for a second. That's pretty cool. I like, I, don't know, I like the darker map. What do you think? A little bit more tricky to see, but I, don't know, I think that looks really cool. Matter of preference. But there are some basic settings there. Nothing overly important. And then next up is moving into phone from your device in order to search. Adding in a phone. Device, select the name that matches vehicle name on the screen. So on your phone, what you're going to do is hop into and you're looking for Kia. We can adjust that name. I'll show you how to do it in a minute. Let's pair up. Allow contacts and favorites to sync up. I'm going to say no to that one. Obviously, if this was your car, you'd say yes. But as you can see there, fully synced up. So you can look at your dial pad if you want to along the very bottom there. You, was yeah. So it said unsuccessful because I said no when I connected the phone. But you can see what's currently going on with your phone connection along with your battery levels and things like that. You can push and hold the voice command prompt on the steering wheel if you wanted to be able to activate your Siri assistant there too, which is kind of nice. So Siri activated and then close it down from there. The vehicle does have support for Android Auto and Apple CarPlay. It's a wired connection and you have to be a USB type A. So there is a C port down the center stack, but you have to use a USB type A on this end. And then either Lightning or iPhone 15, you can use just a USB C instead, but perfect. Do you want to allow CarPlay while the phone is locked? I'm going to say perfect. There we go. And CarPlay. Okay. Should be. Launch in and look at that. Beautiful. Beautiful and super responsive too, which is great. You've got your current time connection level, which map application was open last, which audio application, miscellaneous application. And then you can go to a home screen or an icon view instead. Google Maps, Apple Maps and Waze on the iPhone side of things don't have pinch to zoom capability, but you've got drag and drop capability. You can adjust your heading, search for addresses, look at previous destinations. Google Maps is the same idea. So you can hop into Google Maps and where's it got me? I'm in like the middle of the ocean somewhere. I am literally in the middle of the ocean at zero. <laughs> That's wild. All right. So obviously not in the middle of the ocean there, but you could easily adjust it this way if you wanted to. Done. You can search for addresses. You can also look at route options. So if you wanted to avoid highways, toll roads, ferries, and things like that. Back out, Waze works the exact same way. So Waze, you're going to notice this one. If you wanted to let people know of an upcoming obstacle, things like that, search for addresses, etc. Very straightforward. Then there are things like Hoopla, which is a library app, and there are all sorts of other audio apps that you can use inside of this. It's really nice. So you can also press the voice command prompt on the steering wheel connected through CarPlay to activate your Siri assistant that way instead. On your phone, if you jump into general settings, CarPlay, find the vehicle, you can forget the car, allow CarPlay while locked. I definitely recommend doing that one so you don't have to unlock the phone every time you want to use CarPlay. And then customize the launcher. So let's say if you're a bigger fan of using podcasts and you love your audiobooks, you can do a drag and drop. You can also delete certain things from the vehicle there as well. So it removes the icons, but they still are there. You can do a plus in order to add them back in. If you don't like the way that you've readjusted, you can just hit reset in order to bring it back to the default layout there instead. Oh, you too. Ah, oh, wild. I can't believe it's back on my phone, but very straightforward there. Now, what you can also do 
if you unplug, go into setup, device connections, gives you a few other options. So if you go into device connections there, you can have the phone set up for Bluetooth. So it's going to essentially connecting for phone and for audio. Voice prompts, yes or no. Let's see the other one here, Bluetooth system info. That's where we're going. So if you wanted to change your vehicle name, that's where you're going to make it happen. So if you wanted to tweak it out, Bob's ride, Sally's ride, whatever the case may be, you're going to your device connections, Bluetooth system info, vehicle name in order to make that happen. So it's very straightforward there. Nice and simple. I like it. Well, let's say you set up an iPhone inside the vehicle. Next up, setting up an Android device is the exact same process. So if you weren't on the phone ad screen, you could just go to phone, which I mean, the iPhone is still connected. So there would be the option to swap phones if you had the phones connected already, but you go into setup, device connections, device connections, you can add a new or delete. So actually just hit delete. You're going to hit add new there. Bluetooth phone from your device in order to search on your device. Select the name that matches vehicle name on the screen. Searching for Kia or whatever you changed your vehicle name to. Bluetooth pairing requests or hitting OK. Perfect. There we go. So connected to the vehicle there. And then it's going to come up. Do you want to connect your contacts and things like that? I'm just going to hit no. But as you can see, both phones are connected. And one cool thing about having both like multiple phones connected is that if you had one phone with all of your audio and then one phone where you just wanted your phone calls, you can kind of do a mix and match there. You can only have Android Auto or Apple CarPlay hooked up at the, like one at a time, but you can do any of these four simultaneously. And then you can also set connection priority. So if both phones are connected and let's say if you had phone calls and audio set up for one or for both, it's who's it going to try to connect to first. So like I said, you can kind of do a mix and match all the way above there if you'd like to. Very straightforward. Now, very similar to the iPhone side of things inside of the Nero, you are looking at wired Android Auto. So you're just going to plug yourself in. Opposite end of the cable, plug it in. And there we go. Android Auto would like to, so we're going to hit next there. Okay. I do notice this happens sometimes. Not necessarily, oh, there we go, perfect, all right. It sometimes does take a little bit for Android Auto to get connected, but I mean, as you can see there, fully connected, which is great. There's this little split screen view, and then what you could do is you hit the map and you're full screen there instead. Nice pinch to zoom capabilities, drag and drop capabilities, search for addresses. You could look at traffic, route options. So if you wanted to avoid toll roads, ferries, etc., It's very similar to what you saw on the iPhone side of things. You can go plus or minus this way. And then along the outside, it's your current connection status, maps, and then just some miscellaneous applications. You can press and hold the voice command prompt in order to be able to activate your Google Assistant that way. <laughs> nice and straightforward. Press there for a little split view or an icon view instead. Now, very similar to the iPhone side of things. On your Android, if you search for Android Auto, go into your Android Auto settings, you can look at previously connected cars, but you can customize the launcher. So we've got a basic icon layout there, but you can do a press and hold in order to be able to adjust this out. But one thing is that it's not dynamic like it was on the iPhone side. You actually have to get out of Android Auto, disconnect, and then reconnect in order to be able to have these changes take into effect. So you still could customize the launcher. It's just, like I said, not as much information that was available as what you saw inside of the iPhone side of things. Tons of different options available there, though. And what we saw, we can unplug there, hop into setup. And then if you wanted to remove phones from the vehicle, you just go device connections, device connections, both phones, but you can delete. Select the ones you want to delete and delete. Yes. And there you go. So a few seconds in and you're fully disconnected. So it's that easy setting up iPhones and Androids inside of the vehicle. And hopping back home. So you've got voice memos as well. So you can record memos in the vehicle. There are climate control settings down the center stack there. And then you've got different ones available here too. So you can adjust out climate driver passenger side. If the passenger side is set to something different, you can sync it up to the driver. Do you want your AC going? Driver only mode. And then do you want it going to windshield, face, feet, some sort of combination or an auto mode for the vehicle to determine where it's going? So you've got a few different options available. So three different auto modes. Do you want to have the vehicle automatically dehumidify, defog, defrost, etc.? I always just recommend just keeping all of these ones checked off. Back home, valet mode, so you can lock out the screen if you don't want to worry about a valet driver looking through different options. 
quiet mode means that if, if with quiet mode enabled, it's going to lower all of your volume. So if you've got sleeping little ones in the back. Radio info. So you've got a few different options there. So FM, AM, Sirius XM, there are presets that are available. So no presets that are currently saved. But you see there, all of the stations that are available in your local area. But if you wanted to save a station, 94.9 is a pretty good local one. You've got FM, AM, Sirius XM, and then presets that you've saved. So saving a preset you saw there was straightforward. You could seek this way. There's a tuning rocker down there. You can push the voice command prompt if you wanted to be able to seek that way instead. But regardless, once you've gone to the station that you want, you can add it as a preset instead. Like I said, station list in order to get to all of the available stations in the area that you're in. So for AM, FM, etc. Moving down to the top, you can scan Sirius XM channels, delete presets, reorder them, and things like that. So if you're not a fan of the presets that you've got, you can select and delete whichever ones you want to. Sirius XM is straightforward there, and you can easily adjust out different channels that way if you want to. You can search for different channels that way through Sirius XM. Up along the top, favorites, and then you've got sound settings too. So tons of different options. One big thing I recommend for your sound settings, you've got tone, so or position I should say, so if you're the only one in the vehicle versus centered out, but tone is the big one. I usually recommend dropping the treble by two, cranking the bass by three to give yourself really good audio inside of this thing. You can adjust all of your different volumes out, so guidance, radio noise, you can adjust your parking warning, so the beeping that you get as you back up, etc. Parking safety priority, it's gonna lower all of your other volumes and then connected device sound. So how loud or quiet do you want Android Auto, Apple CarPlay to be? Very straightforward. Shooting across, there's setup, and there are a ton of different options available here. So basics, you've got a series of options for driver and convenience settings, speed limit assist, and things like that. So you can go back to this main screen to jump right into any of these options. Or along the side, if you hop in, you can adjust a few things out individually here too. Let's see, big ones, drive mode, eh, not a big deal. You can adjust what's going on with the cluster screen. If you have the head-up display, that would show up with some options. Basics for lights. So there's ambient light inside the vehicle. You can adjust the brightness. You can adjust the color that you want to instead. You can link it to the drive mode, or you can have it dim when it's dark out. Turn signals, you can have it so that it's three flashes, one, five, or seven. Head, uh, high beam assist is the other big one here. So high beam assist, what that's going to do is if you are in the auto high beam mode and then an oncoming vehicle is coming, it's going to dim your high beams and then turn them back on again. And then headlamp delay, when you go to lock the vehicle, do the lamp stay on automatically for you. Options for the door, do you want to lock or unlock when you're shifted, parked, etc. Do you want to toggle off your power lift gate? So it's going to be just a manual one instead. You can adjust how fast or slow it opens up there. So two different speeds. How high do you want it opened up? And then there are two other options. So smart lift gate means that you can use the key fob in order to get into the vehicle without unlocking. And then you can also open up the windows using the fob itself. So let's hop outside and I'll show you some key fob tricks. Let's go through some basics. You can unlock, or you can lock the door. You can unlock, you can remote start. There's the trunk release and then horn or panic alarm as well. So there are a few pretty neat tricks that you can do with the fob inside of the Nero. So I guess the first one is gonna be remote start. So you wanna make sure you're locked first and then you're just gonna press and hold. And it's an electric, so you can't really see too much. You can see the side view mirrors are highlighted there, and then the cluster screen is now on. So let's see, you know, it's remote started. To cancel the remote start, you press that circle button again once, and that's canceled the remote start out. A few other neat highlights is that you've got a smart lift gate inside of this. So as long as the vehicle's locked, you have to get about 10 to 15 feet away for about 10 to 15 seconds. And this is the smart lift gate feature that I'm showing you right now. So you do have to enable it inside of the multimedia screen of the, uh, the infotainment screen. But once it's enabled, like I said, walk away for 10 to 15 seconds, 10 to 15 feet away. And as long as you've got the fob on you, start walking towards the back end. Boom. And then it's an auto lift gate up feature. So it is a smart open, but you have to close it yourself. A few different ways that you can do it. So right on the lift gate, it's the, the key fob itself, or you can push there in order to close it instead. Very straightforward. There's one other neat trick that you've got inside of this thing. So you have to, I guess technically you're gonna unlock the vehicle, but you're gonna press and hold. And once you do, watch this. You can just release in order to pause, but then you press and hold again. 
and that's rolling down to the first row window. So you could just release in order to stop the process and then you just press and hold to get it going again. Now one downside is that it is going to be a power down, but it's in manual backup. But it still is nice, you've got that option available for the driver's side window. Love all the different options available. And then some basic convenience settings there as well. Rear occupant alert, it's gonna let you know on the cluster screen to check the back seats when you turn the vehicle off. And then you could have your auto wiper. So with this one, when the front wiper is going and you put the vehicle into reverse, the rear wiper is automatically gonna come on as well. And vehicle settings, there were a few others. So you have driver convenience. So there are some basics for smart cruise control. But if you wanna walk through and like how to actually use the smart cruise system, you'll find that down in the description of this video. You can put in speed limit assist. You can get different warnings if you're going too fast driver attention warning. So if you start to veer over into another lane without signaling too many times, it's going to eventually to tell you, you should probably take a break. Different options for driving safety. So a few interesting ones here. So blind spot lets you know on the side view mirrors if somebody's entered the blind spot on either side of the vehicle. And then parking safety. So rear cross traffic alert. So as you're going to back up, if there's an obstacle behind you, it's going to beep at you and let you know that there's something potential, like there's the beeping that you get as you back up. But if there's somebody coming perpendicular, like from the left or right, that's going to tell you of a potential collision that's going to happen. Options for driving safety, which you saw earlier. So as you saw there, you can kind of jump into different options there instead. So there's nothing too crazy inside of these modes, just like some basics that we saw earlier. Some different options for EV, which we've already seen. Navigation settings. So did you want to show different things like guidance, alerts, change out your map, which we've seen. Adjust out your sound settings, which we've already seen as well. So you can adjust your position, tone, and things like that. And all of these settings will save your unique profile if you've got it set up. Adjust your, uh, your device connections, your user profile. So if you wanted to, you can adjust out users that way. Voice recognition, the only one here is you can reduce the number of prompts. So when you push the voice command prompt on the steering wheel, you just won't get as many notifications when you're in the advanced mode. You can adjust the screen layout. So for the cluster screen itself, for the screen saver, it's a cool one because when the display's off, do you want nothing showing up or a digital or an analog clock? Matter of preference, like if, if you had nothing on, I just think it's really neat to have something like an analog or a digital. And then you can adjust out split screen. So what's showing in that split screen menu? You've got a few options for display. So you can adjust the brightness automatically. Toggle on a blue light filter. Useful later on at night if you're going to be driving your vehicle because it's going to essentially dim out some of the colors in order to make it easier for your eyes. You can have it come on automatically or schedule when it'll come on. There are three different buttons that are available. So there's two on the steering wheel and then there's also one down the center stack there too. So you could kind of adjust these things out when they're pressed, what do they do? There's a series of general settings. So you've got things like basic system information. There's a user manual you can scan, adjust date and time as well. So some of these things are grayed out because it's automatic. So if you go into a manual mode, you can adjust out that way. Do you want that military time instead? So the 24 hour mode or just 12 hour? And then do you want to have daylight savings time? Yay or nay? You can adjust out the language. So English, French, Spanish, or Korean. Adjust out the keyboard. And that's really about it for those basic settings. Only other thing to point out, media, there are a ton of options. So AM, FM, Sirius XM, Bluetooth, USB, sounds of nature. There are so many different things. That's kind of neat though. If you're more of like that ambient noise, if you've got kids crying in the back and you wanted to put them asleep, you could do like an old school fireplace. That's kind of a neat setting that's available. Kia Connect, which I mean, you can see there all of these different options available. You do need to have it set up there through your phone in order to be able to use it. Notifications. So if there are any updates and things like that available, and then you've also got the user manual there as well. This is kind of like a little button press to go between either climate settings or you can go between some basic vehicle settings there too. I kind of like the way that Kia's designed this because you've got, you've got well, rockers there, which are either going to be for your climate or it's going to be for volume and tuning and things like that. It's pretty neat. Moving down, got a 12 volt power point there, a USB, which is going to be your data port for connecting Android Auto, Apple CarPlay, or for charging, and then just a charge port. If you've got a phone that sports wireless charging, it is there. You've got your little power button, 
heated first row seats available in pretty much every trim with the option for ventilated first row seats when you get into the wave trim level of the vehicle. So the highest trim will have ventilated first row. Button for heated steering wheel. Auto hold is a neat one because with the auto hold setting turned on, if you are in drive, take your foot off the brake, vehicle's not moving. So it's a very good safety setting. The park sensing system, so that beeping that you get as you back up, if that drives you nuts, you can toggle it off. There is your basic camera there on top of that. So you've got your front view. And then if you're kind of backing up, you've also got that like lower hitch view instead. Like the little rotary shifter, reverse, neutral, drive, into park, very simply. The parking brake inside of this is an electronic. You've got a few cup holders, which, <laughs> love it. Used to play with that all the time when I was a kid. So good. And then this little armrest, easy to lift up. And then there's really nothing down there. It's a decent amount of storage space. But I like the little cup holders there because you can kind of set your larger bottle up if you've got one. Really useful. I like it. There's a tiny little highlight along that part of the dash there. A little glove box that is fully unlocked, so non-lockable at all. Nothing out to that side in the passenger or the driver. Shooting up overhead, you're going to find a manual dimming rearview mirror in the lower trims with the option for an auto dimming instead in the higher. Your basic towing and SOS mode if you need help. Cabin control lights, and then there would also be controls for the little sunroof if you were in a Nero that did have the roof available. It's not a full panoramic, but you still would have a roof, which is nice. Visor in this thing, typical Kia styling, so your light's just over top. Vanity mirror built in. And this thing extends out. Blocking all of the sun. That might be hitting your face. There's also a little assist handle over top there. So hold on, with me being six feet tall, and having the seat set up this way, inside of the second row, I've got a great amount of foot space, great amount of knee space, and up overhead, like three and a half inches of head space. So there is fully functional, usable space inside of the second row of the Nero. It's pretty good. Fitting three full-size adults back here, a little bit tight, especially for whoever's stuck in this middle seat. But one nice thing is that there's no hump in the middle, so there's still plenty of foot space there. I mean, obviously if you have the seats back, it'll get a little bit tight in this middle seat. Definitely not very comfortable whatsoever, but you've got a good amount of cushion when you get to the outboard seats of the Nero. Behind the first row, you've got pockets on the driver and on the passenger side. And one thing I like about Kia, little USB type C power points, that's gonna be the same on the driver passenger side and it's strictly for power. So you're not looking at being able to plug in peripherals and things like that. There's nothing behind the armrest there. The driver's side, you've got just your basic window control, but there would be the option for heated second row seats when you're in the wave trim level of the vehicle as well. Nothing really crazy along the door there. Up overhead, you've got a little handle with a little hook on the driver. And then passenger is just going to be the handle, so no hook there. Little light control up overhead. And then in the seats, you've got a few basic cup holders there, built right in, and then all of the anchor points and then the top tether points as well. So if you've got front facing, rear facing child seats, they will fit inside of this vehicle. The rear end styling of the Nero is pretty neat. You're looking at some unique lamps. There's a tiny little spoiler, and then you're always gonna have the rear wiper, backup camera, and the reverse sensing system standard inside the vehicle. Now one thing, this actually went through a touchless car wash before I shot the video. So as you can see there, all sorts of dirt right underneath where the spoiler is. So it's, I guess, the downside of the touchless car wash is that it's not going to hit this top part. Getting into the trunk of the vehicle, you can do a few different ways. Power liftgate is going to be available. You've got Kia's smart liftgate, which I love that smart liftgate feature. You walk a few feet away for like 10 to 15 seconds, and then you come back to the vehicle and it's automatically going to raise up for you. There's a button just to the left-hand side of the steering wheel, and then underneath the I and the A in Kia, you can push there in order to race this thing up. And the Nero by itself in just the cargo area has a pretty good amount of space to it, but there's not too much feature-wise back here. Nothing off to the left, except for like some hooks for cargo nets, and then off to the right, there's just a little light there. 
Oh, one nice thing about the Nero is that the little carpeted area back here, so the storage tray, you can pull this thing out and you can slide it down to create a little bit more cargo space. So that is available if you need it. One downside to the Nero is that you are looking at strictly the tire inflator kit. So the goop and the inflator kit. So if you pop a tire, you're gonna have to call Kia roadside assistance. But if you just puncture one, you could seal it up until you can get to the next point if you're able to. Folding down the second row bench is straightforward and you could reach it from the cargo area. Just right along the top, you're gonna push and down the seat goes. And when you do that, there is a great amount of space in the cargo area of the vehicle. Now, the measurements that I use are going under the assumption that it's from where the door would shut to just behind the armrest or the console in the first row. So if your seats are forward because you're shorter, they're further back because you're taller, you're gonna lose or gain a couple inches there. But overall spacing in this is good. And like I said, I love that you've got a multi-tiered storage solution. Now, if you don't need to get into the cargo area of the vehicle, you could, go through the second door and right along the top, you're just gonna pull and fold down. Now, some Kia vehicles, when you fold down the second row seat, they're locked in place. That's not the way with the Nero. So it's easy to lift them up and then close them down again. And that was everything you needed to know about the Kia Nero EV. If you have any questions, drop down in the comment section below and let me know. And you can find a build link for this specific Nero, the contact details for Durham Kia and all the tech walkthrough videos in the description. If you found this one useful, give it a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and until I see you next time, take care.